today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23, and it's on page 808 on the Pew Bibles. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. That what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, as Pastor Susang said, um, and I announced, uh, yeah, at the beginning of next month, um, I will I will no longer be a uh, the youth pastor here. And it's interesting. Um, this whole week, I thought about what it would feel like, and um, I guess it's a little bit a lot of mixed emotions for me. Um, I've been at this church uh, since 1995, and uh, I am eternally grateful. Uh, for God to have uh, blessed me. Uh, uh, with wonderful pastors and wonderful congregation members and um, I'm sad, but um, I'm honored um, to preach in this capacity. Um, I think this is the first time I'm uh, preaching to uh, revive Presbyterian Church, Um, but also the last time, at least as the youth pastor. I know I'll probably have more opportunities uh, somewhere down the line, but um, I truly am grateful for um, for this church, for my youth group, uh, for this uh, congregation. Um, and even the Korean congregation. So, um, whew, so please bear with me today, right? A little bit emotional, right? Uh, oh man, I, I was hoping that I wouldn't be this way, but I think as I was walking up, as soon as I stood here, it just like, just hit me. Um, so yeah, so just bear with me. Um, as we continue to celebrate this Advent season, um, Christmas and holidays often bring with it a lot of joy and a lot of fun. Um, yesterday, we had this wonderful uh, party. And you guys can tell um, with all the decorations, it was a lot of fun. We had, um, my wife took a picture. We had this uh, rocking chair up here. And we had this like circular carpet. And, I, uh, and Pastor Young was sitting on it. <laughs> and Nancy took this picture. And you can see this like big smile on Pastor Young. I was like, I, was like, I have to have a mea culpa here. I told Nancy, let's not do the the uh, fireplace, because I was like, oh man, if it's ghetto, like, it's just not going to turn out well, right? Um, but it was like the hit attraction. Pastor Young was up here, all the kids were up here, and um, yes, yeah, so the holidays often pr- bring a lot of joy, a lot of fun. Um, I know for a lot of parents who have college kids, um, this is the season where they come back, right? And so uh, you get to go back to your old family dynamic, right? Um, for our students, holidays often mean um, I get break from school, right? The drudgery of school. Um, and so 
and it's a lot of fun, you know. And as much as Christmas is supposed to be about good cheer and love and, you know, that all of those warm feelings, um, at the same time, um, for many, it can be also a time of great pain, a time of great sorrow and isolation because um, you aren't supposed to feel that way, right? Because it's Christmas. You can't feel sad because it's supposed to be Christmas. The Christmas music is on. And yet, um, in our Advent pas passage today, um, we find that it's actually full of tragedy. Uh, Pastor Joe, if you're here last week, uh, mentioned uh, this, that um, you know, we oftentimes love to celebrate the joyful and hopeful aspects about Christmas, um, about uh, the story of, of the birth of Jesus. And you know, because of we have a tendency to sanitize the Christmas story, right? And so you know, we remember the virgin birth, uh, remember the angels and the shepherds and Jesus bo being born in a manger. And if you're familiar with um, the nativity scene, you know, we have neighbors who might put the nativity scene or we'll have certain churches. I know there's a church in Santa Clara um, that, that has that whole like nativity scene and it's they even sing and have this whole big production, right? And, you know, you have that scene, right? They're in the, the barn, Okay, and you have all these animals who are nice and like mellow and calm and they're like looking majestic, right? Um, and then, you know, you have Mary and uh, Joseph right next to each other. Mary, Mary's looking motherly, okay? Uh, then you have the shepherds looking on with, with hope and, and with glee. And then you have these magi, right, or the wise men come. And usually we, we always associate the magi and wise men with three of them, right? And the reason why we associate it that way is because there were three different gifts that were presented, right? And you have this, like, glorious scene, um, and it's wonderful, okay? And, and these wise men are acknowledging the baby Jesus and offering these gifts. But when you think about the birth of Jesus, the story actually doesn't end right there. And that's where most people end, right there, right? And it's like, yay, and then, you know, end scene. Um, but if you actually think about it, the birth of Jesus, the story does not end there and does not end with joy and peace. Right? Um, the story continues, and um, in our passage, it's told that the wise men, okay, they were actually supposed to go back and report to King Herod. All right? And King Herod, if you guys don't know, he was the, um, the appointed ruler of Judea, and he was a Jew himself. Um, they actually called him King Herod the Great, uh, because there was a good portion of his life uh, where Judea was prosperous and he would, he would build these great monuments and buildings. And so uh, he rebuilt the temple. Um, and so King Herod um, had heard um, from his spies and whatnot uh, this prophecy that there would be a Messiah, a king that would come. And so he heard that these magi were going to go visit. Him. Like, hey, you know, why don't you, you know, go visit him and then go tell me about it. Right. And so his, they were actually supposed to go back. These wise men were supposed to go back and report to Herod. But after they had met Jesus, in a dream, they were told to go back to their country. So they go back to their country. And then we find out that Herod, Herod is in a tizzy um, because he found Jesus to be a threat to his power, his throne. Right. And so what ends up happening is Joseph then... Right, um, receives a dream in which an angel tells him, warns him, Joseph, you need to leave. Okay, you need to leave. You and your wife and your kid have to leave because King Herod is going to come and destroy your son. Right? I know it's kind of dramatic, right? You, you you think about this nativity scene, and you're like, oh, how cute. But then you know, next scene, it's like it's all it gets pretty dramatic here. And then afterwards. Right, it tells us that Joseph takes his wife and kids by night, right, to Egypt, right. And so this wasn't a take your time and pack your bags. Hey, did you forget your toothbrush? Hey, um, we need to get our you know baby pictures or anything. No, this was a all right. Find whatever you have, and let's get the hell out of Dodge, okay? Because King Herod is gonna kill us. All right, we got to move now. Now, why Egypt? You know, being, okay, what, what, what's the significance of Egypt? Egypt in uh, this time was the traditional place of refuge. Okay, if you were 
if you were like a political prisoner or you know you were gonna you're gonna be arrested, you wanted to move to Egypt. Okay. And so if you think about it, at the beginning of Jesus' life, we don't know how long, okay, from the time he was born to the time he had to move. You know, maybe it was like a couple days, maybe it was a couple months, who knows? But at the beginning of his life as an infant, Jesus was a refuge, a refugee on the run. And the ironic part is against the king who is supposed to protect him, right? Now, that's not all. You know, you think, okay, you know, that's pretty bad, but, you know, at least he got to escape. Uh, most of us know, but, you know, if you actually think, of, most of us know this part of the story, too, that King Herod then ordered the slaughter of all the boys to and under in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas. Something that we kind of quickly gloss over so we can focus on the good parts. But if you think about it, it was a truly horrific act. Right? I mean, that would be like, you know, some, uh, you know, Jenny's son, Joey. He's like two years old, right? I mean, think about it. all the kids in our room here, all the babies that we've had over the past couple years, all the, all, all the boys, Moses, you know, we have Moses Kim or, or Park. Right, sorry, sorry, Daniel. <laughs> I was thinking Anna's name, that's why, last maiden name. I'm a Kim too, that's why. Um, but can you just imagine in one night, all those kids gone Joey, Moses, right? Yeji. And not by just some random act of violence, but because, a, because your government your king systematically wanted to take them out because he felt that there was a potential of one of those kids being a threat to his throne and his power. All right. um, at this time, Herod would have been, he was already sick. So he was already in his latter stages of life. And so he, was, he wanted to set up his own sons and lineage. And so Jesus was a threat to that. All right. So imagine that, that during this season, that during Christmas, your government kills all the baby boys to and under, you know, in San Jose, Cupertino, okay, Sunnyvale, Palo Alto. Then if you are a parent, and we have many parents here, or if you are a sibling, Christmas won't always be so joyful because you'll remember this time every year when it comes up as a day that Herod not only failed you as a king, but brought great sorrow upon your family and your life. It would have been a devastating time, a lot of weeping and wailing. And what's crazy is this wouldn't have been out of the norm for King Herod. Right? Some scholars um, doubt this part of the uh, part of the Christmas story that it ever happened because, you know, they're like, oh, we have to cross-reference it with anyone else, you know, any, any other instances where this happened, right, or any other times where this history has been written now, and there are no other times except for this, right? And so some, some scholars say, oh, this, this didn't happen, but actually many historians don't even blink an eye about whether this happened or not because Herod the Great was also known for his great violence. Um, if you don't know, uh, Herod actually killed three of his own sons, yeah, he killed three of his own sons, and at his deathbed, and this is from Josephus, okay, uh, which was one of the great Jewish historians of this time. Okay, That's where we get a lot of our history, Jewish history from, um, of, of, first, of first century Rome. And this is what he said. At his deathbed, he requested that one member of each family in Judea would be killed so that people would really mourn after he died. Okay, that's, that's what Josephus says, tells us. Right? So if you actually think about it, this incident would have been a blip on his personal history and his personal killings, not worth mentioning. This was their king, Herod the Great. And then Matthew kind of po points out right, the fact that this fulfilled a prophecy from Jeremiah 31, 15. Right? Due to this horrible incident, it says what? A voice heard from Ramah. Right. And Rama was actually, uh, so you got to kind of, you know, this is kind of the nerd in me, 
All right, so I'll give you a little background information. Um, Rama is the place of Rachel's uh, burial. And if you don't know Rachel, you're like, okay, who's Rachel? Rachel is uh, Jacob's wife. And you're like, who's Jacob? Jacob is um, the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham, who is the father of Israel. Actually, if you actually think about the name Israel, that's actually Jacob's other name. Right? And, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel come from the 12 sons of Jacob. And so, in one sense, you could say that then Rachel, even though she only had like two out of the 12 sons, okay, um, that she would be, she was the favorite wife, okay, which kind of sucks for the other wives. Um, she would have been the mother of Israel, all right? And so, when you say, when you hear a voice was heard in Ramah, right, at Rachel's burial place, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Oh, what a very apt prophecy for such a situation. Um, but it goes even deeper than that. And I'll just, one quick thing. Um, Jeremiah writes this prophecy in a time where um, Israel was conquered by Babylon because they had not repented to the Lord. And they were forced into exile, right? And so this is, it, 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 it's a time of great sorrow and sadness, right? And so after all this anticipation of Christmas, I know we read this passage, there's just this Paul, isn't there, right? A note of deep sadness at the, at the events. But... You, know, you look at the colors, and you look at, you know, you listen to the music, you go to the grocery store, they're playing the songs, right? You go to Christmas in the park, but Christmas is supposed to be full of good cheer. Yet, like for many families who lost sons that day, and every Christmas would be a reminder of their loss, there are many today when Christmas comes around or the holidays come around, and the pains of life are at its sharpest. You know, this is the season um, where we are supposed to reconnect with our families and give gifts to one another, anticipate, okay, I, wanna, I can't wait for my son's reaction or my mom's reaction when, when they open their gifts, right? But for some, um, it only highlights and intensifies the fact that their family relationships are in shambles. You know, for some of us, um, Christmas is hard because everybody in your family is gathering, but maybe one of your brothers or one of your sisters or one of your siblings isn't coming around Christmas this year or they didn't come around last year because they had a falling out with your parents. Or for some, Christmas is hard because, you know, some, some kids feel this, right? They feel that they have to choose where to celebrate Christmas because their parents are divorced. So do I go here or do I go here? And they feel guilty. If I go here, then does it mean I love my mom less or vice versa? Or grandpa and grandma don't come around. Oh, because they disowned your mom and dad. And it happens all the time. You know, and, and I'm sure we have felt some of this to some degree. I remember I was really close to my cousins uh, way back when. Um, and when my uncle and my aunt separated, uh, I never saw my, my older cousin. And she was the one, and her name was Grace, and she was the one I was closest to. I would go over to her house every weekend. Um, and then one, one year, she just didn't come by anymore. And every year, when I was a little kid, I'd be like, where's Grace? It can hurt tremendously. Um, and to add to all that turmoil, um, I know in this past year our nation has faced with a lot of different things, school shootings, um, race violence. Um, recently I read a news article in, in uh, San Jose how uh, there are more and more uh, people who, who are homeless, but they work, but they can't afford housing, so they live in their cars. Right? They literally just sleep in their cars in, in a random parking lot. Right? Yeah, what a horrible thing to have this holiday season, to not have a roof over your head. It's weird. 
the expectations of the joys of the holiday season can oftentimes identify and magnify the lack that we have and the sorrows that we face and the sufferings that we face. So sometimes, or maybe a lot of times, um, we may not want to celebrate Christmas and get into the Christmas spirit and the joy because it means we have to face our sadness. Um, yeah, I think about this, I know it sounds morbid, but um, for me this is very real because um, both, both my grandparents actually, uh, on my mom's side, uh, died during the holidays. Um, I had one grandma who died the day after Thanksgiving um, during my college junior year. Um, and then about three years ago, um, my grandpa uh, died over the Christmas, New Year's holiday. Right? And um, I would have to go visit him um, at the, um, what do you call it, where, where they have cancer, but there's nothing else to do. Hospice care. Right? And I remember just watching my mom. I was just so hard uh, that holiday season. And if you are struggling, hurting, suffering, or you don't feel like getting into the Christmas spirit, it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge your lack. It's okay to feel like you're, you are world weary, to be in grief, in mourning. But know that um, Christmas is as much for you as for those who have been tremendously blessed this past year or who have great joy. Why? Because of this passage. Now, how can a horrifying Christmas passage be good news to us? I think if you asked me as a little kid, I'd be like, I hate this part of the story. This is like the worst part of the story. Uh, but as I've gotten older, I, I don't know, I, I, I've, I've come to really appreciate this passage. Because it reminds us that God does not shy away from the horrors of the world. That it's in times of tragedy, loss, lack, where we doubt his goodness, whether, doubt whether he'll be there for us. You know, and that's what happens, right? We feel like, oh, God is so far away. He doesn't really care. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. Yet in Jesus, uh, we see in this passage that he doesn't just sit on the sidelines and just watch things happen. He actually puts himself in the mud. He got his hands dirty. He enters into the sorrow. He became human. Not just a human with a silver spoon in his mouth, but he became a refugee. His life was threatened by a corrupt king who ironically was supposed to protect him and his fellow Jews. He was betrayed by his own people. Why? I think this passage shows us the depths to which Jesus would go to show us that he is with us through the darkness in order for us, in order to take us out and redeem us. And I think of other passages. That's why I think about in the book of Hebrews, the writer reminds us that we have a great high priest whose name is Jesus who we can go to because he can sympathize with us because, because he has gone through the hard times. This passage reminds us of that. Then Jesus becomes our hope that in and through him, he will redeem all the hurt because he has entered it. And if you ever sneak back to that Jeremiah passage, so this, that, that uh, quote in Matthew, that he uses uh, comes from Jeremiah 31, 15. If you actually look back and look at 16 and 17, this is what it says. Thus says the Lord. So this is after that whole, you know, Rachel weeps. She cannot be comforted because Israel is in exile. That's what it says. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy, 
Verse 17, there is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. We remember that um, in Advent, Jesus came once. But in Advent, we remember that he will come again. So we wait with expectations because he has you. And uh, I just want to speak personally. Um, and I mean that for both uh, Revive and for New Hope. There is a big elephant in the room, right? It's been a very rough year. I know that as a church, um, It might not be the most celebratory Christmas this year. I know for uh, many members of this church, uh, it's been a particularly bitter pill to swallow uh, when the relationship with the Korean side has deteriorated uh, to such a degree. And that is the elephant in the room. I know. It's, and a lot of times we talk about it in hushed voices. It's hard to see. Um, and I know for many people, I know our pastors have felt this, um, to feel that you have been thrown away by those that we call um, our fathers, our mothers on the Korean side. And I'm sure there's, and it's not always one-sided. I understand that. And I know for um, my youth groupers, I know it's been hard over the past uh, several months to see our numbers get cut in half, to see your friends leave and have to face an uncertain future. I know that there are many in Revive who feel reservation about church planting because this was not the way it was supposed to be, I know. My wife can tell you how much um, this has hurt for me um, personally. It's been a rough season. We can mourn. We can weep. It's OK. But may this passage be a solace to you. because we can lean into Jesus, because he knows. He knows. Because he has gone through it. He has gone through it. And if God's truth is in Jeremiah 31, 16 through 17, especially 17, there is hope for your future, declares the Lord and your children shall come back to their own country. If that is any consolation, he will carry us through this. And, um, and this is where my joy comes from. Not in the songs, not in the decorations, not even in the nativity scene, but this. That Jesus has come and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And I hope that will carry you through this season. Let's pray. <clears throat>